welcome all of you to our national conference uh, entitled Detection and Protection Vulnerable Migrants. As the title suggests, this year's conference is about the detection and protection of vulnerable migrants in the international protection procedure. This topic has not only received a lot of interest from our national partners and stakeholders, but it continues to be a hot topic in migration research and policymaking across EU member states and beyond. The broad interest in this topic is also due to the complex questions it raises. How can we conceptualize vulnerability in the context of asylum where all migrants are potentially vulnerable? What are the legal and procedural frameworks in place to decide which migrant is vulnerable and which migrant is not? And finally, how can EU member states assure the protection of vulnerable migrants? To address some of these questions, we are delighted to have experts from a wide range of institutions and domains with us, including academic research, international organizations, national governments, as well as NGOs and legal experts. In two very promising panels on the EU and the Luxembourgish level, they will present their perspectives and discuss their ideas regarding the topic of vulnerability in the international protection procedure. We are very honored that the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs and the Minister of Immigration and Asylum of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, Mr. Jean Asseborn, will first welcome you as well. C'est avec plaisir que je vous adresse aujourd'hui le mot de bienvenue à l'occasion de la Conférence nationale du European Migration Network Luxembourg. La question de l'accueil et de la protection des demandeurs de protection internationale vulnérables est une question à laquelle le gouvernement luxembourgeois accorde une grande importance. La thématique de la détection et la protection des migrants vulnérables dans les procédures de protection internationale que vous avez le mérite d'aborder aujourd'hui me tient particulièrement à cœur. Cela a toujours été ma euh, motivation personnelle et celle aussi du gouvernement de soutenir les personnes en besoin. C'est dans cet esprit que le Luxembourg continue à prendre ses responsabilités. En effet, nous avons un devoir humain de respecter et de protéger toutes les personnes à la recherche d'une vie digne et sécurisée. Ce devoir s'applique d'autant plus aux personnes vulnérables. Il s'agit de détecter les personnes les plus vulnérables dès leur arrivée au Luxembourg afin de pouvoir assurer un soutien et une prise en charge adéquate. Les personnes qui soumettent une demande de protection internationale au Luxembourg ont souvent vécu des situations traumatisantes, actuellement exaspérées par la pandémie du Covid-19. Cela nécessite des réponses humaines et des réponses professionnelles. Depuis le début de cette année, 1291 personnes sont arrivées dans les structures de primo-accueil de l'Office national d'accueil, l'ONA. Actuellement, 3300 personnes sont hébergées dans les 55 structures d'hébergement gérées par l'ONA et ses partenaires gestionnaires de la Caritas et de la Croix-Rouge. Comme vous le savez, toute personne qui souhaite déposer une demande de protection internationale au Luxembourg est d'abord accueillie dans une structure de primo-accueil. Ces structures de primo-accueil prévues pour un hébergement de courte durée, en principe quelques semaines seulement, servent notamment à identifier les besoins spécifiques tels que les besoins médicaux, psychologiques, la scolarisation, etc et d'éventuelles vulnérabilités permettant d'orienter les personnes au mieux par la suite. Une équipe ethno-psychologique est chargée d'identifier les nouveaux arrivants atteints de troubles psychologiques et au besoin de mettre en place immédiatement un suivi. Ces actions se font en étroite collaboration avec les services de prise en charge psychologique externe. Dès leur détection, l'ONA et ses partenaires gestionnaires Caritas et Croix-Rouge accompagnent les personnes vulnérables en leur proposant, dans la mesure du possible, un hébergement adapté à leurs besoins ainsi qu'une orientation vers les services spécialisés pertinents. 
À côté de cet accompagnement par l'ONA et de ses partenaires, la Direction de l'immigration du ministère des Affaires étrangères et européennes tient également compte des vulnérabilités de ces personnes, et ceci tout au long de la procédure d'asile. Il est important de rappeler que le législateur a expressément prévu des garanties procédurales spéciales pour les demandes donc, de protection internationale. Je suis fier de pouvoir dire que sur cette thématique, le Luxembourg prend ses responsabilités au niveau national, au niveau européen et aussi international. D'ailleurs, le Luxembourg a posé sa candidature à l'élection du Conseil des droits de l'homme de l'ONU pour les années 2022 à 2024. Outre son soutien aux défenseurs des droits humains et à l'état de droit, le Luxembourg a retenu comme priorité pour son mandat la lutte pour l'égalité des genres et la protection des groupes vulnérables contre la violence et la discrimination. Permettez-moi de saluer en cette occasion l'effort et l'engagement collectif dont autant d'acteurs font preuve lorsqu'il est besoin de montrer solidarité, ouverture d'esprit et soutien direct et indirect. Quoi qu'en disent certains, il est important de garder les cœurs et les esprits ouverts et garantir un accueil digne à ceux qui en ont le plus besoin. Je saisis donc l'occasion pour remercier toutes les personnes qui s'engagent pour les migrants vulnérables et bien sûr aussi euh, les MN, l'European Migration Network Luxembourg, pour avoir pris euh, l'initiative de se pencher sur ce sujet à l'occasion de sa conférence actuelle. Je vous souhaite plein succès pour votre conférence nationale avec deux panels intéressants un panel sur le concept de vulnérabilité dans le contexte de la migration européenne et aussi un panel qui discutera plus particulièrement du contexte luxembourgeois. Soyez assurés que je ne manquerai pas de m'informer sur les conclusions de vos discussions. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Minister Asselborn, for this very warm welcome. I also welcome now our Vice Rector for Academic Affairs at the University of Luxembourg, Professor Dr. Catherine Leglu. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Beata, thank you. And I would like to welcome everybody on behalf of the University of Luxembourg. Um, our university, and I'm about to pass into French, uh, notre université a beaucoup de projets en cours sur la migration, uh, et c'est quelque chose qui nous tient à cœur depuis la fondation de l'université en 2003. Le Luxembourg est un pays ouvert, un pays très ouvert, où la migration joue un rôle très important pour le développement du pays et historiquement, de même que pour l'avenir, c'est un des éléments les plus importants pour la construction d'un pays proprement multiculturel et multilingue. Pour nous donc, il est important aussi de signaler que nous avons nous-mêmes des étudiants réfugiés, nous offrons des places à des étudiants réfugiés avec un soutien. Nous avons bien sûr parmi eux des étudiants vulnérables. C'est quelque chose que nous traitons non seulement dans le cadre normal et normatif de, des aménagements raisonnables, mais aussi en cas par cas euh, par notre équipe Inclusion. C'est donc quelque chose où nous pouvons dire aussi que nous avons des alumni qui sont réfugiés, qui sont passés par l'université et qui maintenant se, se construisent une carrière dans, au Luxembourg ou dans d'autres pays euh, qui est marquée par un succès grâce au soutien qu'ils auront eu euh, ici dans le pays de même que dans l'université. Alors, je vous souhaite à tous une journée d'études très intéressante. Moi aussi, je vais assister à, à, à au moins un de ces panels et euh, je, je félicite aussi tout le monde d'avoir pu organiser euh, cette, euh, cette belle conférence. Merci. Thank you very much, Catherine. So we will start with the first panel and I will give over to Adolfo. Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Adolfo Somarivas. I'm the senior legal migration expert of EMN Luxembourg. I will be the moderator of the first panel. The first panel is, it will be entitled The Concept of Vulnerability in the European Migration Context. Uh, we have four panelists. I will introduce one by one. Each one will have 
15 minutes to do the presentation. I will warn the, the speakers one minute before the 15 minutes are out so they can conclude. Of course, I'm flexible, but you know, we, we want everybody to participate. And then we will have a 15 minutes questions and answers, and answers session. So without further delay, uh, I want to give the floor to Mr. Luc Leboeuf. Uh, um, he is going to present a concept of vulnerability from a um, historical perspective. Mr. Leboeuf is the head of research, uh, of research group in the Department of Law and Anthropology of the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology, and I guess professor in law in the law faculty of the Catholic University of Romain, where he teaches courses in migration law and EU law. He is the coordinator of the Bulner Project, which is an international research initiative financed by the European Union under the H2020 funding program. And it gathered nine research partners from which uh, you have Belgium, Germany, Italy, and Norway. And from third countries, you have Lebanon and Canada. So I give the floor to Professor Leboeuf. The floor is yours. Right, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. I'm now showing my screen, hoping that uh, it's showing as it should. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to take the floor today. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to, to join you uh, in this discussion. And what I will try to do with my uh, presentation is to sustain a critical conversation on uh, the uh, concept, uh, on the notion uh, of vulnerability uh, itself, uh, which as Professor Nina Ver said uh, in her introduction, is a notion that's popping up everywhere nowadays uh, in the uh, discourse on asylum and uh, migration, and that has received a lot of meanings and functions uh, depending on the context in which it is being used. What I will try to do uh, in my presentation is to base myself uh, on the first intermediary research results of the Venner project to try to clarify a bit uh, the different functions and meanings of vulnerability in the European countries under study and the challenges that have been raised. Therefore, I will first say uh, some very quick words on the Venner project so that you have a better idea of uh, the empirical data and context on which uh, my presentation is based uh, before moving on to an identification of the main challenges we have identified so far. Uh, first, let me say, uh, as promised, a few words uh, on uh, the Wiener project, the Wiener project that started from the observation that vulnerability is moving from the sphere, uh, which is the analytical sphere, uh, to the legal and policy sphere. In the analytical sphere, uh, vulnerability has been long used uh, by uh, studies in social sciences to depict uh, the complexities uh, of uh, human experiences. Uh, from that perspective, vulnerability is a context-specific notion that, that allows you to understand the continuum of uh, difficulties, life challenges, uh, migrants and uh, refugees, asylum seekers uh, may uh, be facing in different contexts. Yet, vulnerability is also increasingly being used uh, as a tool uh, to uh, decide on asylum application and to decide on the kind of treatment asylum seekers will have pending the examination of their uh, asylum application. This has, of course, uh, quite a wide range of consequences because a concept which is context-specific then gets turned into some bureaucratic categories uh, that need to be uh, well established so that the system can function and so that public servants on the ground know what to do, know how to detect uh, vulnerable migrants and know how to uh, protect them. And we wanted to, uh, with our project, to uh, have a look at these tensions and to contribute uh, to the debate to an approach that will combine the study of uh, the legal and policy frameworks that are uh, already in place, including the way uh, they are being implemented by public servants, uh, with uh, uh, a field work among uh, asylum seekers to uh, document uh, their actual experiences. The reason why uh, we wanted to start uh, with this legal uh, analysis and with the study of the implementing practices is also because we recognize that much has already been done and we want to document that and we want to use that as a source to identify what can be done 
uh, better and what are the good uh, practices, what are the best practices uh, that should uh, continue, uh, of course. So we wanted to move beyond an approach that will uh, simply focus on vulnerabilities uh, on the ground, but would not seek to connect this uh, with uh, the challenges states have in identifying, detecting and addressing uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, the first phase uh, of the project is over. Uh, it consisted of that legal analysis combined with interviews to document uh, uh, the implementing practices. And that's uh, the kind of data I'm using here uh, for uh, my uh, presentation uh, that will give an overview uh, of uh, the uh, main uh, findings. First, uh, what our study has shown so far is that uh, you have two main uh, uses, two main bureaucratic uses uh, of uh, vulnerability in each uh, of the European countries uh, under study. Uh, the first use uh, is to uh, detect uh, what are being called special or specific needs. Uh, specific needs is the wording of EU law. Uh, special needs can be found quite often in uh, the documentation at national level. And uh, we even have another language uh, which is being used in Norway that is not an EU country and which is not bound uh, by EU law where they speak of extra needs. And the idea behind that is very much to uh, identify uh, this uh, manifest uh, and immediate needs uh, that arise uh, with respect to some categories of asylum seekers. So what do they need uh, so that uh, they can uh, receive humane reception uh, condition so that they can receive a fair chance at presenting their asylum application? Uh, this refers to, for example, the system that has been put into place to deal with minors, who of course need uh, special uh, guarantees uh, in order to be able to present uh, their asylum application. It also refers to people suffering from trauma and other health issues, uh, etc. What we've noticed uh, in, in our project is that this uh, focus on uh, immediate and massive manifest reception and procedural needs uh, is uh, addressed in different ways uh, depending on the countries. You have some countries uh, such as Belgium and Norway, uh, and certainly Belgium, where you have a very formalized identification procedure. You have certain steps that must be followed uh, by the public servants, and that starts uh, from the registration of the asylum application with a questionnaire uh, that needs to be filled in. And that goes on a uh, trial founder procedure uh, with continuous vulnerability assessments uh, that are being performed uh, in the reception centers uh, by the staff, by the social workers, and also as part of the examination of the asylum application uh, by the, uh, what we call production officers, so the civil servants who decide on this asylum application and by the judges. Uh, this is also the case uh, in Norway, and to some extent in Germany, where the approach is however very different uh, depending on uh, the lender, depending on the federal entity concerned, uh, because the competence to deal with reception condition is uh, not a federal competence in Germany. Other countries uh, like Italy have a completely pragmatic approach. So there is this requirement which is being made uh, to public servants to address a vulnerable profile, uh, but there is no uh, standardized procedure and there are no uh, standardized, standardized tools uh, that need to be used. Now, how do uh, public servants you make use of that uh, possibility? How do they react uh, re regarding these procedures that are being into uh, that are in place and that are that have been more or less formalized, depending on the countries uh, and the studies? Well, uh, one general uh, and common trend among all interviews in all the countries uh, is that the public servants emphasize the need of having sufficient leeway to address each individual situation. So there is a, a high level of uh, awareness and understanding among these public servants that every migrant and asylum seeker uh, is vulnerable to some extent and that not everything uh, can be uh, formalized, not everything can be properly assessed uh, through a questionnaire uh, and that uh, they need sufficient leeway so that they can uh, react uh, to uh, the specific profile of each uh, asylum seeker so that they can react in an individualized way. And one can see, of course, that behind that, uh, there is also uh, a sort of emotional aspect. Uh, you have some asylum seekers uh, that raise a higher feeling on compassion uh, uh, on, on the side uh, of the public servant, uh, which is justified uh, by their specific situation. And public servants would like to have the tools to be able to react uh, to this uh, particular uh, situation uh, that cannot always be uh, uncaptured properly uh, through standardized uh, questionnaires and tools. 
At the same time, however, and that's the whole tension uh, in the field, uh, there is often uh, a regret on account of public servant that they lack resources to spend time to probably assess uh, vulnerabilities in all their complexities. That's one aspect. And on the other hand, that sometimes guidelines are also missing on what to do uh, with this vulnerable person. So the problem is not so much how to identify that, it's, it's really what to do with them uh, afterwards. With uh, an overall risk uh, which is being raised uh, uh, based uh, on our data, uh, which is a risk of moving towards some kind of sanitized uh, vulnerability assessments in which uh, vulnerability are being assessed based on standardized tools, such as a questionnaire, uh, which are being filled uh, very quickly without taking the time of uh, discussing uh, with the asylum seeker of uh, understanding uh, his whole uh, situation. So that's really a risk that has been highlighted. Detecting vulnerabilities is an important task, but one must also uh, be careful and not to fall into the trap of a sanitized uh, vulnerability assessment in which uh, we just follow a checking list approach uh, that doesn't lead uh, to concrete effect and that doesn't allow in the end to uh, actually address uh, vulnerabilities. Just to make this a bit more uh, concrete, I've uh, highlighted some excerpts uh, from the interview which I think show quite well uh, what I have just said. Uh, one is from a social worker in Norway here uh, who says, well, uh, actually it's very easy almost to identify these obvious vulnerabilities, such as someone who's heavily traumatized, such as someone uh, who's a minor. But when you want to delve into the intersecting factors of vulnerability, when you want to analyze the actual position of the individual, then it takes time. Uh, it also takes time to establish a bond of trust. And that's not something that can be done uh, through a questionnaire, which is being filled uh, very quickly from the outset of the process. Uh, NGO case worker in Italy, uh, says uh, the same uh, in substance. Uh, they say that uh, there is a, a need uh, to uh, let other factors of vulnerability emerge and a need uh, to be cautious uh, when uh, addressing uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, a protection officer uh, in, within the Belgian uh, Asylum Authority has the same kind uh, of discourse uh, with also an emphasis on the need to have a sufficient leeway uh, to deal uh, with uh, the uh, specific situation of the person uh, they are being confronted to and not to be burdened by uh, many, many uh, guidelines, questionnaires, standardized tools that in the end stand in the way uh, of a proper uh, vulnerability assessment. No, uh, vulnerability is not only used uh, as a tool uh, to identi identify specific needs. It's also used as a much more loose and flexible concept uh, that will guide uh, the evaluation of asylum applications on the ground, being to assess the degree of credibility of the asylum uh, story. I think everyone can understand that a minor, a child or someone who suffers uh, from trauma, uh, from uh, psychological issues, might not be able to articulate uh, it, his asylum story or her asylum story in the same way as someone who's uh, well educated. But vulnerability is also used beyond that uh, to assess the risk of ill treatment of the country of origin with the understanding that some people are more, some groups are more vulnerable than others in the country uh, of origin. I'm thinking, for example, uh, about uh, gender related cases and gender related uh, persecution. In that case, uh, we see vulnerability being mobilized by uh, public servants who are in charge of deciding on asylum applications and judges. Uh, as a flexible tool that guides the individualized assessment uh, of the specific uh, circumstances of the case. So they will, uh, when explaining how uh, they deal with credibility, when explaining how they deal with uh, evaluating the level of risk in the home country, they will often say, well, we make a vulnerability assessment, uh, which is not something that is very uh, formalized. Uh, it's really a general idea of uh, being careful about vulnerable profiles and uh, being extra cautious when it comes to uh, some uh, vulnerable uh, individual, uh, which is then uh, used in a very elastic way, uh, with sometimes also the feeling that this uh, way is so elastic that uh, it sometimes depends uh, on the person who's in charge of deciding on the case. I think this interview with a, a Belgian judge uh, encapsulates this and exemplifies this uh, quite uh, clearly. Uh, this judge says, well, uh, there is on the one hand this vulnerability assessment uh, that is connected with special and specific needs, and I will have a look at that, especially given that in Belgium we have this questionnaire which is being filled uh, at the start uh, of the asylum 
a procedure, but I will go deeper because uh, there is much more to it uh, in the story and there is much more uh, which I need uh, to uh, consider. Uh, it is important, uh, however, to uh, underline that challenges have arised uh, uh, given these two ways uh, uh, and these two functions uh, that vulnerability seems to have received so far in all of the countries uh, of us under study. The first one, and I think you, you got it already, uh, is this issue of uh, still having a consistent engagement uh, with the actual vulnerabilities of the person, which takes time and which cannot be done uh, through uh, standardized tools. These tools help, they are necessary, but they're not enough. Uh, the second issue uh, that comes up in all of the countries uh, under study, and even more in these countries such as Germany, uh, where the competences are being uh, divided between different uh, federated entities, is a lack of consistent communication channels uh, between the state actors involved. It's very common uh, for uh, the actors, and especially uh, those deciding on asylum application, to complain about the fact that they don't have enough information about what's going on uh, in uh, reception centers. And that's something that's true for all the countries uh, under study. So maybe there is something that needs to be done here. And finally, because I think this is a dimension uh, that needs to be raised, uh, is the reluctance of uh, some state actors uh, to uh, recognize a vulnerability uh, as such and to engage with it uh, so that it becomes more clear what it means uh, from a legal uh, perspective, so that it becomes more clear what the legal obligations are attached uh, to that. Uh, that's true uh, in all of the countries and the study when you speak about higher courts, so I'm not speaking of lower courts uh, that deal uh, with asylum application, but with... I'm Professor, speaking of high... uh, Professor Le Lebeuf, yeah. uh, the, uh, two minutes uh, to finish, please. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much for telling me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so higher court, we set uh, the general legal uh, standards to be respected, uh, usually avoid uh, delving into the issue, which they perceive as uh, very political and having uh, something that relates to practices. And I think a good example of that is the fact uh, that uh, in the uh, recast of the reception directive that's currently being discussed at EU level, uh, the word vulnerability has disappeared and is replaced uh, by uh, special uh, needs. And I will conclude here uh, by uh, emphasizing uh, these uh, political uh, dimensions uh, of the vulnerability notion that make it uh, a concept that also remains uh, uh, contested. Uh, I think that uh, that's, that's a viewpoint I, I have here, uh, that uh, these political dimensions need to be a knowledge in two uh, directions, so to speak. Uh, the first one is that once you start using this uh, analytical concept uh, into uh, the asylum procedure, uh, you uh, necessarily have a discussion that will arise on who is vulnerable, uh, given that this has implied exclusionary effects. Uh, once you use and you mobilize vulnerability as part of the asylum procedure, you give a more favorable treatment to those who are deemed vulnerable, and that will lead, of course, to tensions and uh, discussions uh, as to know who is vulnerable, because this person will have a, a more favored treatment. And I think that one needs to keep in mind uh, that this discussion uh, are also directed in a certain direction by the vulnerability notion in itself, because the notion is grounded in feminist theories, it's grounded in the ethics of care uh, that give particular attention to uh, the needs of children, of minors, and also to inequalities that are related to traditional uh, gender roles. I'm thinking of uh, gender uh, related aspects here, such as uh, the protection of LGBTQI plus uh, minorities. So it's something uh, that's, uh, that, that, that pops up and that becomes uh, important when using uh, the vulnerability notion. That's not a bad thing, of course, but it's something to be aware of because that directs uh, also the political discussion that are more and more arising uh, regarding the vulnerability context concept. And I will uh, leave the floor uh, to the next speaker here. And thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lebeuf. Uh, very interesting presentation and a lot of food for thought that we can discuss later. Now I give the floor to Nicolas Van Uymboek. I apologize, my Netherlands and my Flemish is not very good. So, uh, uh, Nicola works as a senior policy officer for FEDASIL, that is the Belgian Reception Agency. His main field of expertise 
Art Vulnerability, Resilience, and multi Multilingual Communication. He has coordinated research. Uh, he has coordinated research on the identification of special reception needs, the provision of appropriate accommodation and daily life experience in the reception centers. As you can see, Mr. Uh, Nicolai is going to give provide a presentation more from the practical side, explain uh, how, give a small little presentation on how, how they detect this in Belgium, vulnerabilities in Belgium, and talk about some research projects that they have conducted. So Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Quickly sharing my screen. I hope everyone can see my presentation now. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, as was mentioned, I work as a senior policy advisor at Fedazil, the Belgian reception agency. Um, and today in my presentation, I would like to share you some reflections from the field, from the field of asylum reception and how Belgium has dealt with so-called vulnerable residents. Um, and I think this is an interesting um, case, the Belgian case, because Fedazil's approach of vulnerability is currently undergoing, let's say, a conceptual reorientation. Uh, the previous presenter, uh, Professor Leboeuf, already uh, made a reference to Belgium and to its very formalized procedure. Um, we are experiencing some limits uh, of this formalized procedure, and this is exactly what I want to talk to you about in my presentation. To put it briefly, we have learned that using the notion as a selection criterion to distinguish the vulnerable from the not vulnerable is inherently difficult, as most of you know, uh, and it's often also flawed. And we are in the process of moving towards a more open conceptualization in which we are trying to use the notion of vulnerability more as a sensitizing concept instead of, instead of using it as a selection criterion to make our staff uh, and the agency in itself more aware of the special situation and circumstances of most of our uh, applicants of international protection and not just a small subgroup um, within our uh, population. So therefore the title of my presentation is Moving Beyond Vulnerability as a Selection Criterion. And to substantiate and uh, illustrate my, my, uh, my position, my stance, I will proceed in three parts of my presentation. First of all, I would like to start uh, with some historical milestones in Belgium's reception policy. Uh, secondly, I want to highlight um, some research findings from two uh, researches conducted by the Research and Policy Unit at FEDERZU. And thirdly, I would like to present you the crossroads where we are at at the moment, uh, uh, moving towards a notion of well-being and promoting well-being instead of um, selecting vulnerable residents. So let me start with some historical milestones. Um, Belgium's reception policies have developed significantly over the last 35 years. And we've evolved from a system allocating financial support um, to uh, applicants of international protection to a system offering material provisions, as is the case in most countries. But it is especially due to this shift to material provisions um, that specific needs have, have gained prominence and, and visibility. And I want to briefly take you along uh, the 35 years of Belgium's reception policies uh, to show you some milestones in how we have uh, developed the, the approach of vulnerability during uh, this period. So we start in 1986 with the opening of the first reception center, the Petit Chateau, the Little Castle. Um, at the time, um, it was a temporary transit center in the city center of Brussels, uh, intended for short stays only um, before people received financial support. And applicants arrived there and they underwent medical examination, screening especially for infectious disease, diseases such as tuberculosis. And all applicants were basically treated in the same way with little attention to their specific needs. However, within this material um, accommodation, little by, little by little, um, practical and ethical concerns were raised especially for this uh, uniform treatment, and especially um, the unaccompanied minors and uh, persons with specific medical needs uh, were raising uh, attention. And um, in response to that, uh, a second milestone 
was the opening of uh, specific in the beginning rooms, then wings, and in the end reception structures for these uh, two uh, categories of, of, of people. So uh, people with special medical needs and unaccompanied minors. And it is important to note that, oh, sorry, that at the time um, when these provisions were opened, uh, there was no legal framework supporting it. Uh, there was still no um, uh, council directive as the directive of 2003, um, and there was no national um, obligation to identify special needs for applicants of international protection in Belgium. Um, of course, this changed with the council directive of 2003, and Belgium was one of the first countries transposing the directive into uh, national law. Um, and this leads me to a third milestone, the reception law in 2007, um, inscribing the uh, specific legal uh, provision uh, or need to identify within 30 days after arrival uh, within the reception network, specific needs of, at the beginning, it were um, uh, seven categories, I think, and there were three added along uh, the years. Uh, in the beginning, it was minors and accompanied minors, single parents of minors, pregnant women, people with disabilities, um, and victims of trafficking. And later, um, some categories were added, namely the elderly, people with serious illnesses, and people with mental problems, and persons who have experienced torture or rape or have suffered from other serious forms of psychological, physical, or sexual violence. Now, with the law in place, um, there was severe leverage for new specific uh, arrangements to, um, to come into being um, regarding um, people with vulnerable profiles, um, especially in 2010, and this is the fourth milestone, a uh, special reception center um, called L'Elogie de Louvrange by Caritas International was opened for vulnerable women. Um, in the slipstream, we had some special conventions for people with specific medical and psychological needs also uh, by, uh, run by NGOs. And lastly, as a sixth milestone, I would like to mention the opening of an arrival center um, where uh, new residents are systematically screened, both medically and socially, in order to dispatch them to appropriate, appropriate accommodation adapted to their needs um, after the arrival center. Now, it is a coincidence that this arrival center opened in the exact same location uh, as the first uh, reception center, the Petit Chateau. So it's still in the same building, but the priorities have, uh, have changed. Whereas in the beginning, in 1986, everyone received a uniform treatment. Today, the core essence of the arrival center is to assess special needs and identify vulnerable persons as a key priority. Um, so there is still a TBC screening and people undergo vaccinations. Um, but apart from that, there is a, a medical examination an in-depth medical examination. Um, and apart from a basic social screening, uh, there is also the option for um, uh, an, an in-depth social screening. Um, we have specific SPOCs, uh, so single persons of contact within the arrival center for a number of um, special uh, needs of specific groups, including LGBTIQ+, human trafficking, gender and domestic violence, pregnant women and newborns, psychological needs and procedural concerns and voluntary return. Now, as this overview, this historical overview shows you, um, Fedazil over the years has developed, let's say, a targeted approach centered on a number of strictly defined target groups, especially in accompanied, in accompanied minors, vulnerable women, and persons with medical and psychological needs. They're often, um, offered specific reception accommodation, and often in intense collaboration with specialized partners, with NGO partners, um, and uh, Fedazil builds on, a, on procedures for early identification. Um, the, the arrival center is the, the exponent of this. Now, at the time of the opening of the arrival center in 2018, Fedazil uh, asked itself, now, what is the future for vulnerability uh, and the identification of vulnerable persons um, once we have this um, arrival center in place? And some critical remarks were raised because in the end, if we look at the number of specific groups, which is still relatively limited, if we look at the number of reception accommodation for specific groups compared to the overall number of 
um, uh, our accommodation, it is still rather limited. So how do we advance? How do we go on from there? And to um, open up, let's say, um, the discussion, um, Ferrazo decided to conduct two researches. Um, one research um, on um, how reception workers in the field experience the notion of the vulnerability, and a second, how um, our applicants themselves when in our resident facilities, how they uh, experience uh, the notion of vulnerability and being in a specific uh, place. Now, these researches led to some insightful uh, and surprising results, and uh, I will briefly go into them. So first of all, the first research uh, by reception workers uh, focused on social workers and medical staff, uh, and we conducted 17 focus groups of a total of 111 collaborators. And what we noticed is that they seldom used vulnerability as a category in daily practice, as they considered it a stigmatizing notion and a notion which was of little and little use. Secondly, when we asked them to define vulnerability, they associated, so our, our staff associated it to many more factors than those mentioned in the reception law. For instance, they made reference to uh, issues such as family composition, literacy, sexual orientation, young age, all of them not present in the reception room. When we ask them to um, evaluate the persons who are classified as vulnerable, um, they, our reception staff, considered that they are still extremely diff different, uh, the, the people classified as vulnerable, and that they are not, um, because they are in the same category that they do not share in inherent or intrinsic um, um, similarities. Lastly, um, they were rather critical of early identification procedures, considering it very difficult, especially in an arrival center, to assess in an early stage um, vulnerabilities because vulnerability is considered to be something which evolves over time. Um, and especially at the arrival center, um, applicants do not necessarily trust um, the, the reception staff, or they are, let's say, overwhelmed by a sort of euphoria to be in a reception facility, whereas actual vulnerabilities all only come uh, to, to, to rise um, after, after a while. Let me move on then to the second research. The second research in which we conducted 106 in-depth interviews with a wide range of residents in four reception facilities, asking them how they experienced their daily life uh, in reception facilities. And there we found that residents split explicitly do not want to self-identify uh, with the notion of vulnerable or vulnerability, and they uh, often have to creatively adapt their lives to meet um, what they consider to be difficult reception conditions. And if we ask them how, do, how they uh, look at vulnerability, uh, they found that a range of factors related to reception facilities made them vulnerable rather than uh, some characteristics uh, associated to themselves. Uh, so the, the, the aspect of being in shared rooms, uh, long waiting procedures, or the uncertainty associated with uh, reception um, and an and application of international protection is making them um, vulnerable in their, um, in their perception. Um, what we also noticed it, is that there is very little sense of community among residents with similar profiles, and there is a large distrust among residents. And lastly, um, residents often feel worse after spending time in reception accommodation in contrast to their situation at first arrival, also uh, raising uh, question marks about this early identification. So together, um, these research findings put some question marks around the targeted approach which has been developed by uh, Ferrazil over the years. Um, firstly, because the research shows that vulnerable, vulnerable persons um, are widely diverse and the group definitions that we use um, in the targeted approach do not match actual complexity of our resident population. Secondly, um, it is not so straightforward to make a distinction between those who are vulnerable and those who are not, 
because all residents, in a way, uh, seem to treat, seem to um, face threats to their well-being. Although it is true that degree, the degree in which this is the case might might vary. vary. And thirdly, um, it is an illusion that the vulnerability can be assessed once and for all early on in the procedure. Instead, reception workers need to remain attentive to changing needs and difficulties over time. So these research findings um, leave us at a crossroads. Um, they put the targeted approach into perspective and show us that we need to move uh, beyond, um, beyond vulnerability as a selection criterion and to move towards a more uh, open conceptualization promoting well-being rather than um, using vulnerability as a selection criterion. We are aware that we cannot move forward uh, the vulnerability approach by extending our um, categories of vulnerable persons. So we cannot just design special accommodation for new categories as a way forward. So uh, new categories such as the illiterate, young adults, transgender, the, the elderly, etc. This would inflate the notion of vulnerability, and we would um, leave, this would leave us with an uh, impossible situation where we have um, so many um, specialized places, which is impossible to manage. What we need instead, and this is um, our, our current approach, we need a continuous monitoring of well-being and a preventive strengthening, especially of supportive factors and uh, resilience. And we also need a general sensitivity, a general sensitivity amongst all reception workers about the difficulties our applicants face. Um, this knowledge should not only be within specialized NGOs, but should um, be present within all our staff working at uh, Fedazil uh, and partner reception facilities. Um, and lastly, we need to address often neglected dimensions of well being, um, dimensions such as multilingual communication, um, the needs of accompanied minors apart from unaccompanied minors, but also recreational activities, sense of belonging, participation. Um, so it is at this crossroads that Fedazil is now in, and we are working towards how we can um, implement this new vision into, into practice. Um, we call it the mainstreaming of vulnerability uh, in which we, as I previously uh, mentioned, want to use vulnerability more as a sensitizing concept rather than as a selection tool. Um, I hope my presentation was, was clear and I'm more than happy to answer uh, your questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Actually, the, uh, the conclusions of your research actually uh, give a lot of thought to do. So I hope that there will be a lot of questions from the audience and the Q&A session. Now, without further delay, I'm going to give the floor to my colleague, Ralph Petri. Ralph has been working with the EML Luxembourg for the last five years. He he has a master in anthropology. And right now he's working on a inform that we are producing and will be available for the public at mid October of this year on the, uh, the concept of vulnerability. So Ralph is going to present today the, the preliminary findings of this inform that will be available. So without any further delay, I give the floor to my colleague, Ralph Petri. Ralph, the floor is yours. Oh, sorry, thank you. I was uh, looking for the unmute button. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Adolfo. Indeed, I will present today the preliminary uh, results of an upcoming EMN uh, publication. Uh, entitled uh, Detection of Vulnerabilities in the International Protection Procedure. So from, an, uh, from an, uh, a national uh, frame, uh, as we just passed through in, in Belgium, we will move to a more uh, EU member state um, comparison. Um, so at, at the source of this publication are two EMN ad hoc queries, um, which we launched in, in April uh, this year. Uh, for those who, who might not know the, um, the ad hoc query tool, it is an electronic tool uh, 
that the EMN national contact points and the European Commission uh, use to collect comparative information on very specific uh, topics with specific questions. Um, in the context of this uh, two odd queries, um, they were answered by 23 uh, member states, uh, which you see here uh, displayed on, on the screen. And uh, as Adolf already mentioned, um, the results will be um, published in, in about two weeks or so. So uh, please keep an eye out on, uh, uh, on our website um, to, for, for uh, the publication. Um, so we heard already um, a lot uh, in the two presentations earlier. I just want to give an, uh, a recap of uh, who is considered a vulnerable person um, within the EU acquis uh, on, on, on asylum. So we have, as mentioned also by, by Luke earlier, we have the recast asylum procedures directive who provides an, a list of which applicants are in need of special procedural guarantees. So when it comes to the, to the asylum procedure itself, and then second, we have the recast the reception conditions directive, which provides a non-exhaustive list uh, of who is an applicant with special reception needs. Um, so uh, as one can see already on the screen without going too much into detail, um, they are not exactly the same. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they cover different, uh, to, to some extent, uh, diff different categories. Um, so uh, based on this, we, uh, we ask the member states, what are the most common vulnerabilities that are detected in, in the respective member states? Uh, and we found that there are roughly um, three different categories. Uh, so to say, we already heard it uh, earlier as well. So one category is um, uh, based on age and family composition of, of the applicants. So uh, in this context, the majority of the member states reported that unaccompanied minors are among the most vulnerable. Um, uh, persons detected in their uh, in their respective member states, and as a second category, uh, single parents with minor children. Um, but indeed, one can mention here minors in general, so it, it can also be accompanied uh, accompanied minors. Um, a second category relates to the psychomedical condition of the applicants. Um, here we uh, have particularly uh, men uh, were particularly mentioned by the member states issues related to mental health of the applicants. Uh, by 14 member states, as well as victims of trafficking, uh, torture, or other forms of violence, as mentioned by Merci. seven member states. Sami? Um, Sami? Sorry, there is somebody who has the microphone on. Um, and as, as, a, as a third category, we found uh, uh, gender and sexual orientation. Um, so these uh, relate to victims of rape, gender-based, or sexual violence. Uh, human trafficking for sexual exploitation or domestic violence or uh, five member states as well indicated uh, women more generally or specifically single women and, and pregnant women uh, to be particularly uh, vulnerable and detected as the most uh, vulnerable in, in their respective member states. Um, in addition to this, six member states reported to not specifically register uh, in, in a database or so um, um, yeah, data on, on vulnerabilities. Um, so when it comes to the legal framework, we yeah we saw already also earlier and uh, and um, also based on on the two uh, directives, we see that in nearly all member states, it is either the asylum law or the immigration law plus um, if if applicable related legal provisions that regulate the detection of vulnerabilities in the international protection procedure. Uh, immigration law here relates to uh, member states where the asylum provisions are also integrated in the immigration law. Um, so this is, for example, the case in, in, in France and in, in the Netherlands. Um, then we have already heard earlier, uh, and we have it in Luxembourg as well, uh, in Belgium, Finland and Luxembourg, there is also a uh, reception law, uh, which, which includes the provisions of the uh, recast reception conditions. In addition to those... Um, to this legal frame, uh, yeah. In, in addition to the to this, the legal framework is often uh, complemented by internal guidelines or standard operating procedures, as well as dedicated questionnaires or forms. We also heard this already before, so there, there is a lot that, that ties together um, with the previous presentations. And um, so, as a consequence, uh, in all member states, it is then uh, primarily the responsibility runs responsibility of the authority in charge of asylum and or the authority in charge of reception. Uh, to detect vulnerabilities of, of applicants. Um, and uh, in addition to this, uh, of course, as it is a very complex, uh, complex topic, there are additional stakeholders um, involved or directly in charge, also partially in, in many member states. This includes, for example, authorities in charge of immigration, uh, 
in some member states, they are in charge, for example, of, of the very early stages of registering an application. Um, the same for police and or state border guards uh, who are also in, in charge of the early um, application, uh, asylum applic um, procedure uh, in, in some member states, such as Slovenia or Latvia, for example. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to the assessment of medical vulnerabilities, the medical professionals play a very key role in this. Um, and also other relevant uh, stakeholders, particularly in the field of reception, as you also already heard, uh, for example, NGOs managing reception facilities. This is also, for, the, for example, the case in, in Luxembourg. Um, when it comes to the procedural framework, it is important to mention that uh, the detection of vulnerabilities may take place at any stage in the asylum procedure and shall also be uh, taken into account, of course, throughout uh, the, the whole asylum procedure. Um, a first phase where uh, vulnerabilities are detected is usually the registration of the application for international protection. Um, in this case, uh, first visible indications such as age or family composition, or sometimes if possible, the psychomedical condition of the applicants are already registered um, and included in, 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 in the files. Um, Cyprus and France um, in, in this context mentioned that they have a, a, a particular vulnerability interview in that very early stage to kind of already detect um, indicators for vulnerability at, at this uh, very early stage. And we already heard uh, the example of Belgium with uh, um, a specific questionnaire and the registration form where uh, the asylum case workers can uh, specify very vulnerable applicants right at the, at the very stage. This includes, for example, um, women in, in, in late stages of pregnancy or um, applicants with immediate uh, need for, for medical care. Um, a second phase, as also mentioned by Nicolas, is, is the medical examination, which member states may require, such as in Luxembourg, for example, or offer um, or yeah, notify the applicant uh, that, that they may go undergo a medical examination on grounds of public health concerns. So this is a more general, let's say, a medical examination and not a specific uh, medical examination on, on, uh, on signs of persecution. This uh, part is included in the inform as well. Actually, um, there were questions on this specifically, but it is not part of, of, of the presentation today. Um, and then a, a very key phase is, of course, the reception um, where vulnerabilities might be detected either um, by the responsible authorities and, and its staff, um, or as well, of course, the, the staff uh, working in the reception centers, so the, the, the social workers or nurses or psychologists of, uh, of either the authorities or the NGOs uh, that, that are uh, working and, and managing uh, in, in reception centers. Um, in this case, uh, it was indicated that uh, relevant information is usually communicated to the responsible authority upon agreement by the applicant, for example, if special reception needs are identified that might have an impact on uh, possible provisions of special procedural guarantees in the asylum procedure, then they are uh, usually communicated uh, upon the agreement by, uh, by the applicant. And then as a last phase, um, Vulnerabilities can also be detected uh, in, in, during the personal asylum interviews or even during the examination of the application. These can include, for example, situations where uh, vulnerabilities either arose or were only detected after the arrival of the applicant in the member states. Uh, these may, for example, include pregnancy or mental health issues or the formal identification, for example, as, as a victim of trafficking in human beings. Um, we had in addition to this, we had one, uh, one uh, or a couple of questions to kind of try to find out what happens once the uh, vulnerabilities are detected, what, what happens then uh, concretely. So are there procedures in place to guarantee the follow-up um, of, of the applicant and, and, and its uh, specific needs? Here we found that the majority do have, uh, would, yeah, reported to do have such a procedure in place. Um, five member states reported to not, to not have a specific procedure in place, but this, of course, does not mean that uh, there is no follow-up. It, it's just that it is in, an, in, 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 an, uh, in a different way, so to say, as we also heard earlier, uh, it might not be a specific procedure that prescribes the whole uh, steps to take, but it's a more case-by-case -case, um, case, uh, yeah, procedure or a way to, to conduct it. Um, for those member states who do report it to have such a procedure in place, um, at, at least our analysis found, as was also already mentioned by, by Luc earlier, there seems to be a, a difference between more formalized follow-up procedures, again here the example of, of Belgium, for example, 
um, or less formalized or more informal procedures, which was also covered by Luke earlier with, uh, for example, Italy or France, where there is a procedure in place, but there is still a somewhat of a flexibility and also a responsibility of, of the caseworkers to, to ensure really the, the follow-up. Um, yeah, um, so we already heard the example of Belgium, so I might just maybe briefly uh, just, uh, just mention it as, as well. So um, there is an, a personal administrative file that is uh, that that is uh, first uh, set up by the immigration office in charge of the early phase of, of the application that is then transferred to the commissioner general for refugees and stateless persons who is the responsible authority in charge of the international protection procedure and uh, fedazil which is the agency in charge of of, of reception um, a social and medical intake is then uh, uh, conducted of the applicant, including uh, the drawing up of, of specific files. And we already heard as well about the 30-day re-evaluation. Once the person is in the reception facility, the procedure foresees to re-evaluate if the accommodation is adapted according to the needs. Um, if no solution can be found in-house, then there is a possibility to, to accommodate the applicant in an external institution. And in these cases, um, it is assured that the administrative and social follow-up are guaranteed. And um, as it was also indicated earlier with the communication between the state actors here, for example, FEDASIL uh, can make recommendations to the responsible authorities with regards to special procedural guarantees that they identified in, in the field of, of reception. Um, and then, yeah, so talking about uh, special procedural guarantees, um, we found that they mostly relate to the asylum interview itself. Um, so in, in, yeah, in these cases, for example, the location, time and setting of the interview is usually adapted to the applicant's special needs. So in this case, for example, um, interviews can be conducted either in the reception facility in an alternate uh, or alternative location or sometimes even in writing. Um, interviews can also be either shortened or split up into multiple hearings or even postponed if necessary to a later date when, when the person uh, is, is apt to, um, to conduct the interview. Uh, furthermore, interviews are conducted with specific care. For example, it is uh, generally avoided, of course, to, to, um, to ask uh, questions that might trigger past traumas or past uh, experiences. Additional explanations are provided to really make sure that the applicant is, is, is aware of, uh, of the context of the asylum procedure, uh, the provision of sufficient breaks to allow the, the, the person to feel more uh, at ease uh, while doing the, the, the interview. Um, and then, for example, was also mentioned that after the interviews, uh, vulnerable uh, applicants might uh, be provided with uh, more extra time to provide medical evidence. Um, and in addition, applicant applications are uh, usually assigned to experienced caseworkers who are used to work on on uh, on uh, applications uh, of vulnerable persons. And in in some member states, there is also um, the possibility to to treat them as as a priority. Um, the applications, um, and then as a last point. Um, with all this being said, we had one question on on what is then uh, the impact on the international protection procedure um taking all of these elements into account so uh, moving on from the special procedural guarantees so apart from the special procedural guarantees offered or yeah provided during uh, during the procedure we found that uh, there is generally no direct impact on the assessment of the international protection application itself um so that there, there is no uh, general answer basically to this question because it really entirely depends on the individual uh, circumstances of each applicant if uh, the application is, is accepted or, or not uh, and international protection is provided or not. Um, with this being said, uh, Lithuania, for example, um, mentioned that uh, their legislation stipulates that standard criteria in the evaluation of the application, such as comprehensiveness and coherence of statements made um, are not applied for most vulnerable uh, persons. This includes, for example, unaccompanied minors or victims of trafficking. Um, I believe this was also mentioned by, by Luke earlier um, in, in yeah, this general uh, point. Um, and similarly, for example, in, in Ireland, there is a, a so-called staff guidance on assessing credibility in place uh, where um, uh, case workers are uh, yeah, advised to take into consideration that there might be feelings of shame, stigma, or fear that might uh, impact the credibility of, of assessments made. So these uh, elements should be taken uh, into account. 
And lastly, for example, Austria mentioned that, um, yeah, according to 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 uh, to certain conditions provided by the law, of course, and also based on on the basis of vulnerability, authorities may grant a, a so-called residence permit for individual protection um, in such cases. Um, so yeah, this uh, this was a kind of a, a tour d'horizon of of all the of, the, of all the member states, and I'm also happy to um, to uh, give some answers uh, later in in the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph, for this uh, through presentation of this outcoming EMN Luxembourg Inform. That we hope that we can, as I mentioned earlier, that we will be able to uh, publish it by mid October at this moment. Uh, so I go to the last speaker of this panel. Uh, uh, Madame Anne Kaiser, Ms. Anne Kaiser, she is advisor to the Secretary General uh, Special Representative on Migration and Refugees at the Council of Europe. Previously, she was Justice and Home Affairs Counselor in Migration and Asylum at the Permanent Representation of Luxembourg to the EU. And before that, she was Deputy Permanent Representative at the Permanent Representation of Luxembourg to the Council of Europe. And even before that, she used to be protective officer at the Director of Immigration in Luxembourg. So uh, here is somebody who has done the groundwork as well as the diplomatic world and the political world uh, work in this field. So uh, now Anne is going to talk today on something that is quite new, is the the Council of Europe Action Plan on Protecting Vulnerable Persons in the Context of Migration and Asylum in Europe, 2021-2025. So, Anne, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes to talk about us on this issue. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Adolfo, and thank you for introducing me also as in my former capacity. I'm very happy to be here and reconnecting with my Luxembourgish links. As you said, I was working over 18 years in the <coughs> Luxembourgish civil service, and now I'm a seconded official to the Council of Europe, still continuing on, on migration issues. So I'm happy he to be here to present uh, the, the work of the Council of Europe on this topic. And it's actually a good follow up to the former speakers who, who did map and, and present what is currently ongoing. And for me, it will be much, uh, a much more forward looking perspective as we are only starting our work on this issue. But of course, we will have to take into account everything uh, which is uh, currently being done. So I will, I should have done that before, but I will share my screen. Does it work? Yes, we can yes, see sir. it. Okay, thank you. I had some technical issues, so I'm happy if now everything works. Um, so directly to uh, shortly put it into context, who is a special representative on migration and refugees? He was only created in the Council of Europe in 2016. So in the aftermath of the big uh, pressure, 2015 pressure uh, of migrants coming up from, from Syria mainly. And in its mandate, so there are fact-finding missions, there are, there's a lot of intergovernmental uh, cooperation and coordination. So I will mainly focus on those two last issues because the action plan falls under the competence of intergovernmental uh, cooperation co and, and coordination with the member states through this network of focal points also quite newly created, but also coordination with uh, many other actors um, active in the field, such as international organizations, such as NGOs, such as uh, the EMN, with whom we have an excellent uh, ongoing cooperation, thanks to, to Adolfo now. And uh, we really need 
this kind of, of cooperation to to build on the work that exists and to go forward uh, in, a, in a positive uh, direction without duplication and uh, with complementarity. So action plans, this is the way uh, the Council of Europe goes forward to put into perspective a currently done action, to implement the current standards and to, um, to, to, fix, to give itself a line on where to go in the two, three, four, five next years in concrete terms. They are supported by member states. They are actually approved even by, by member states, but there are a list of topics of concrete actions. Uh, the first action plan that the, uh, the special representative on migration and refugees uh, had to carry on was an action plan on protecting refugee and migrant children, which finished in 2019 and which has a number of uh, of achievements where you see the list. It was focusing on, on children, so it's mostly compilation of child-friendly approaches in the area of migration in order to, to promote those the good practices and to, to give um, good ideas to other member states to go further on it. There's a handbook on child-friendly information, recommendations on, on guardianship, but also on transition to adulthood, practical guidance. So that's just to show that something is already existing and uh, a reflection was ongoing at the end of this 2019 action plan, thinking, is it needed to go further? And if so, where? So this is uh, when member states decided to support a second action plan. Uh, which would enable to follow up on the first one on protecting uh, vulnerable, I mean, my, uh, children in migration, but uh, while still while having a new and expanded uh, focus. And this is when the idea of focusing on vulnerable persons in the context of migration came up, as um, Minister Asselborn said it, and as many of the presenters said it before, it is a focus that we are taking internationally, that member states are taking with all the difficulties it entails, with all the challenges it has, there is still a need or a will to help the most vulnerable, uh, despite the fact that, of course, all migrants can have a certain degree of vulnerability as the European Court of Human Rights uh, found it. So concerning the focus, uh, of course, the most difficult part of adopting the adoption plan was to decide what was vulnerable persons. I will not dwell on this because the first presenter uh, presented it very well and, and underlined the difficulties of what uh, is such a definition. The way we got around it was to get out of our first idea of a list of who the vulnerable persons might be because that was absolutely a no-go for member states, some of them wanting more, some of them wanting less categories of vulnerable persons. So uh, the decision was to, to keep it general and to have this wording of persons found to have a special, to have special needs after individual evaluation of their situation. So we are taking here the term special needs, although the EU talks about specific needs, but at the end, uh, it's kind of the same. And we linked this uh, definition to solid and dynamic references to Council of Europe standards and mostly to European Court of Human Rights case law. So that means that uh, we uh, have the whole range of vulnerable persons that were in the, identified in the, in the courts, in Strasbourg courts case law, uh, which uh, is um, and, um, comprised in this definition. So that includes, of course, uh, children, uh, uh, women or uh, LGBTI persons, persons with special uh, health uh, needs, but it could be actually any migrant, any asylum seeker, according to its specific situation, as it was found in the MSS um, judgment of the court. Uh, of course, it's an individual evaluation, and this is the most important part of it. The state have a competence to identify those uh, vulnerabilities and to protect it. So the evaluation is a case-by-case -case basic from member states.
uh, structure of the action plan. So we're not inventing anything. We're just following the core values of the Council of Europe mandates, which is human rights, rule of law and democracy, adding a transversal pillar because there's a strong need to talk to each other. The Council of Europe has a huge number of small um, services working, the one on children, the other one on women, the, the one on violence against women, on youth, on health, and so on and so, on, so on and so forth. And our role here in the SISG office is to coordinate all of this, to bring it together, but also to have this dialogue with member states and to uh, see what is really needed. The Belgium example just detailed uh, before was really interesting and this is exactly what we need. Member states to show how they are doing, what their challenges are and who help us reflect on how to move in a better direction to give inspiration to, to other member states. So to go a bit in the content of um, this action plan, uh, focusing on the protection on vulnerable persons in migration, our flagship project here is to have a practical guidance uh, for the identification and the respect of vulnerabilities throughout uh, asylum and migration procedure. We are not creating any new standard for that. We are just taking up what already exists through the Court of Human Rights case law, through the many monitoring um, bodies that have established uh, standards. You certainly know the CPT on detention of asylum migrants, but also the Grevio on domestic violence, the, the Greta on trafficking, the Lanzarote Committee on sexual exploitation of children, and, there are many who have already identified what vulnerability is and how to address it. And we will just take up those existing standards by trying to put them together and, and help member states to go through all of those um, uh, different steps of vulnerability screening. Uh, a big mapping exercise is needed for this because a lot already exists and I've heard uh, three very good uh, presentations today showing that uh, reflection is ongoing and this is why we really want to connect with partners and maybe this conference is also a way to start to kick off on that and, and to start uh, getting together uh, to, to build on what exists and take up uh, challenges. Uh, for us, identification is uh, important, despite was, but, uh, what was said now by, by Fedazil. We know what the uh, EU is planning to do. We don't know if it will be able to go to the end of it, but the screening procedure uh, does underline the need uh, to have a swift vulnerability screening. And with more and more border procedures opening and developing in, in EU member states, or non-EU member states as well, Council of Europe member states as well. It is for us very important to have a swift vulnerability assessment, not to uh, expand the practice of detention too much, but the swift procedure, of course, has to take into account uh, the need to build trust and to identify um, all the existing vulnerabilities. So it's a, it's a big challenge. Others try to do it uh, before and we will not uh, have a magical wand for it, but uh, that's our flagship project and this is where we want to work on. Around this, there are many other projects which are being done either by, by Council of Europe entities uh, or supported by us, uh, namely the one to address vulnerabilities uh, throughout migration. Uh, procedures and to enhance procedural safeguards. So this is uh, um, access to information and to justice for vulnerable migrants. Uh, there's already work ongoing and will just continue. And then specific vulnerabilities will be addressed also, such as uh, statelessness. There were recent, recently, well, last week, a big uh, conference where EMN and Adolfo participated. And thank you very much for this, uh, to look at ways to also address this um, big issue. Uh, addiction of drugs uh, to drugs also is one of the um, themes or smuggling of migrants. 
And then we are still and always promoting alternative to detention, and this is strongly linked to vulnerability, but not only, it's for obviously every migrant that alternatives are better than detention when, when possible, of course, and positive narratives and all kinds of activities on enhancing integration of um, uh, refugees. Uh, there are special areas also in the action plan, namely on protecting refugee and migrant children, because we are following up to the first action plan. So a lot of follow up actions such as on effective guardianship. There was a recommendation, but we're drafting an explanatory memorandum and trying to go further on it. Guidelines on age assessment. This work has started and it's very uh, difficult and controversial, but uh, especially with 47 member states, but it's uh, uh, we're trying to have some kind of, uh, of guidelines on this issue. And uh, well, sexual abuse, I've mentioned in guidance on family based care, the work is almost finished on this. And uh, there are also very practical tools, such as one to support um, um, practitioners in uh, to include refugee children in in schools and uh, and then follow up of work we have done refugee and migrant children uh, women sorry are also on our focus with a new recommendation uh, well actually an update of the existing uh, council of europe recommendation which is from 1979 so then need of uh, uh, um, sorry, an update on this, and the promotion and use of practical tools uh, for women's safety. This will be done by the Gravio, by the sector uh, uh, competent for the violence against uh, women. Health issues, of course, in the context of uh, COVID-19 will be on our um, focus as well with the identification of health-related vulnerabilities, but also uh, the promotion of equitable access to healthcare for everybody, including migrants, and the guide to health literacy, where vulnerable persons are, uh, where migrants are a kind of vulnerability also concerning health literacy. Finally, a word on general implementation. I've said it briefly, um, Council of Europe is a big entity with a lot of many specialized departments and many of them will be in charge of implementing their own projects uh, according to their ordinary budget and, and planning and we will just oversee it and make sure that there is a link between uh, all of those and that there is proper uh, transversality, but we will need also, and this is why we are uh, here, we will need to engage in dialogue and create synergies with member states through this network of focal points where 47 uh, representatives of member states are invited. Uh, for the moment, I think 44 have uh, designated a representative, some of them having uh, technical issues. Uh, others other kind of issues but this is where we really have a dialogue with ministries with ministries of interior or or ministries responsible for migration issues so for luxembourg it's a um, ministry of foreign affairs who's in charge and there we really have we really try to engage in dialogue and promote implementation of council of europe standards and 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 build with them further action uh, depending on needs and international partners are, are, of course, in the core of our uh, business here. We cannot work on our own. Our member states are member of a lot of other in, uh, international organizations and a lot is being done. We have a good uh, cooperation with FRA at the moment. We're building it with the ASO. UNHCR is working with us constantly. There's, they have an office in, in the same floor as us within the Council of Europe here. EMN has become an increasing uh, partner and this is really wonderful because their work is so useful to us. So we hope to be doing all this in the five years time span that we have for implementation. That's it for me. Uh, here are the websites if you want to, um, to click on them. I've also asked the organizers to send the um, brochure, the, the link to the action plan. So I don't know if you see it. I don't have a picture, but here is uh, uh, 
the booklet that we've just published and I uh, also insert in my email in case you want to be in touch please feel free and follow us on social media that's all for me thank you thank, uh, thank you very much Anne for this uh, through a thrill expectation a explanation of that new action plan as Anne says EMN and the Council of Europe are working hand in hand on a series of issues that goes from statelessness, vulnerabilities. Now, uh, last week, we will begin uh, seeing the possibility of work on artificial intelligence. So uh, uh, the collaboration is ongoing and I believe is very fruitful. So now, as I see, well, we finish, I, for the first time in my life, I handle to finish the panel on time. And so we have 10 more minutes for questions and answers. If you have them, if not, we will uh, we will make a, a, a stand or coffee break. Uh, I have seen two questions so far in the in the chat. So uh, the first one is for my colleague Ralph uh, from Petra Blasejova. Excuse me for my pronunciation that I never handled. Uh, and uh, is well. Could you please write this a little bit difficult? Uh, probably is what, can you explain what is, what was meant by formal and informal procedures after identification of vulnerabilities and special needs? Ralph? Yes, uh, yeah, thank you Adolfo and thank you as well for, uh, for the question. So uh, I, I didn't explain it probably uh, properly in, in the presentation, but the, the publication includes, of course, a disclaimer that this is based on the analysis that we conducted. So um, member states were not asked to provide an explanation on are you have you a formalized procedure in place or a less formalized or you know informal procedure. So this is based on on the analysis that we did. So the let's say that you know the, the member states are not responsible for us basically putting them in, in the one uh, category or the other. But basically what I meant is, or what we mean in, in the publication is that uh, there seem to be member states that, that do follow a certain, uh, yeah, a certain fixed pr procedure in terms of either standard operating procedures that kind of prescribe the different procedures and steps that need to be taken by the, by the respective stakeholders in, in involved, be they the, the authorities in charge themselves or managing, uh, managing uh, NGOs, for example, for reception facilities. Um, whereas in, in other member states, um, the answers that were provided were mainly that, you know, that there is a certain follow-up that is guaranteed, of course, but the, the, the procedure was not, let's say, prescribed in detail what different steps are taken or are necessary to kind of uh, fulfill this, this follow-up from, from A to Z, let's say. So, um, yeah, the, the short answer is basically that, yeah, it, it is based on, on the analysis that we conducted on, on, on the findings um, between, yeah, more formal um, procedures based on maybe even administrative practices uh, that build over the years from experience and, and more, uh, yeah, more or less informal uh, 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 follow-up procedures. So I hope that this an, uh, answers the question. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, there is another, well, there is uh, a comment from Jet Tevez. Um, uh, she's writing, a, a, I was wondering if and how information about vulnerabilities of applicants is shared among stakeholders in the asylum procedure. Then. Uh, she, uh, there are four questions, but I will ask Nicola uh, to explain, for example, how FEDAS is sharing information with authority deciding on the asylum app application, or if it is shared with other institutions, uh, if there are formalized procedures to this end. Well, the problem of how does it, this relate to GDPR, that is Belgian law, so if you want to refer, but for me, uh, the GDPR is uh, is obliged, and for example, the transfer, the consent of applicants as legal ground is based on the GDPR, so that is already. But if you want to comment on this, Nicola, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for the interesting question. Uh, I did not discuss this in detail because I focused on special reception needs instead of special procedural needs, but I can say a word on the on this topic. Um, as a background in Belgium, the determining authority is strictly separated from the reception authority. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, this is the same as in uh, Luxembourg. So the Commissioner General for Refugees and Stateless Persons who is the determining 
authority is different from the reception authority, Fedazil, and its uh, and its uh, operating partners. Now, this said, uh, the immigration law, the Belgian immigration law, provides the possibility for uh, reception um, authorities to, uh, let's say, make recommendations concerning special procedural needs towards the determining or authority with the permission of uh, the applicant. So uh, this relates to GDPR. Uh, the um, applicant needs to consent in the uh, sharing of information uh, between uh, different authorities. Now, I think this is a really important uh, point because um, as the reception authority, we are well aware of specific procedural needs that might not um, pop up during the more, let's say, formalized uh, questionnaires and procedures uh, of the immigration office and of the determining authority. Because residents stay within our reception facilities, uh, we see them on a daily basis, whereas the, uh, uh, the immigration office and the uh, determining authority only see them occasionally. Um, so this provides us with a great um, responsibility to give recommendations to the um, determining authority. However, there are some difficulties uh, in the relationship between reception and determining authority. Uh, first of all, which uh, specific or special procedural needs will be taken into account by the determining authority? We have no um, let's say, agreement uh, between the authorities on this topic. Um, so this has to be, in the future, uh, the point of a, of a further uh, collaboration. Secondly, even if we make recommendations as a, a reception authority, the question still remains how the determining authority can um, assess whether it's really the case. <laughs> they perhaps have, has to, have to reassess uh, the, uh, the, the uh, recommendations made by the, uh, by the, the reception authority. Uh, and then still there is a question of how to translate the recommendations into actual um, uh, adaptations within the uh, procedure. Um, so still more work uh, to be done, uh, but I hope this um, sort of like answers the question and opens up uh, further debate. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, this is a very interesting question. I'm seeing there are more. Uh, now we are picking up with the questions. Uh, there is one for Professor Leboeuf. What could be the practical implications of the fact that the decisions, whether somebody is vulnerable or not, is political? And there is a follow-up question. Could authorities change something about how they make this decision or how they frame and communicate it. In any case, uh, the, uh, in most member states, ministries have the, the right, uh, the authority has the right, the, the discretion on to determine who is vulnerable or not uh, without going through a technical procedure. But this is just for, for clarification purposes. Professor Leboeuf, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much also uh, for the question, uh, Matisse. Uh, maybe I should clarify here first what I meant by uh, the political dimensions. And what I meant by that is, uh, however you frame it, uh, when you mobilize vulnerability, uh, when dealing with asylum seekers and migrants, uh, or asylum seekers exclusively, uh, whatever, uh, the uh, fact is uh, that uh, you, you're deciding on how you, what kind of treatment they will receive from the state. So what's happening there is a decision about how state resources are being uh, allocated. And that's what I meant uh, by the political dimensions of that decision, is that they have, uh, that it's a, it's a decision that's linked uh, to how we deal uh, with state resources. And of course, that's what leads uh, to also uh, some kind of debate and some kind of opposition uh, that, that can come around uh, this uh, very concept of vulnerability. And I think uh, that in that, uh, the uh, EU New Pact is a good example uh, where you have vulnerability, which is used as a way to say uh, we need this special attention uh, to vulnerable uh, asylum seekers, but at the same time, we also need uh, special attention with the vulnerability assessment tool of the borders uh, to make sure uh, that uh, borders are not vulnerable either. So you, you can see that behind this notion of vulnerability, you always have uh, this uh, whole uh, political dimension that pops up 
uh, very quickly. And when commenting on the Global Compact and uh, why vulnerability is in the Global Compact, uh, François Crepeau, uh, a former UN Special Rapporteur who, who was uh, instrumental in that work, uh, also wrote that vulnerability uh, was this kind of uh, all-encompassing notion that allows to find uh, a political uh, agreement uh, with then all the issues uh, that can arise on the ground. How can, uh, how can we do now uh, when we try to do something with it uh, on the ground to uh, indeed uh, improve uh, protection needs uh, as uh, the administration are trying to do it, as the public servants are trying to do it through their everyday job? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, it, it's important indeed to communicate uh, on what's being done uh, so that it's clear uh, how this uh, very broad uh, political discussion uh, that can sometimes pollute the everyday work uh, actually uh, play a role or do not play a role and, and what criteria the authority base themselves on, uh, what kind of approach they have. So I think that uh, transparency uh, is indeed uh, something very important. So that was for uh, the bit more the, the political aspect. I hope I was clear and I thank you for your question. Thank you very much, Professor Leboeuf. Uh, uh, I see in the chat uh, another question of Madame Vieira uh, about in, uh, not uh, fewer visible vulnerabilities that may be associated with the condition of being a migrant. Uh, let, uh, here I would like to say, I am not very clear on what we are talking because here we are saying uh, normally the vulnerabilities is uh, people who have been tortured. So uh, I don't, uh, the condition of being a migrant, uh, are we talking about discrimination or other things? Can you please precise the question because it's not very clear. So I can address it to the panelists. Mm. Perhaps it's also. Um, I I think I I'm, I assume I, I I know what the the person who asks asking the question wants to know. Okay. Um, no, no, it's good because and, I don't understand. Let Let me give an uh, illustration of some uh, vulnerabilities which might be more invisible uh, than others, such as, for instance. The linguistic capacities of a, of a migrant. Um, let's say a migrant arrives in a, in a arrival center and he or she is illiterate. This might not just be visible at first sight, uh, but it might be related to uh, the background of the of the person, whether he has um, uh, been to school or not. Um, the, the the aspect of him or he, her being illiterate um, opens up. Um, difficulties uh, to inform about the specific procedural and accommodation needed because the person might not be able to understand uh, um, questions being posed to him or her about uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, so I think linguistic capacities are an illustration of a, of a vulnerability which has not been um, acknowledged so far because it's not in any um, in any uh, legal provisions, uh, but it do it is related to the to the um, aspect of being a migrant and of being an applicant of international protection. So perhaps this is uh, an illustration of what um, lesser visible uh, vulnerabilities might be. Thank you very much, Nicola. And um, I believe I don't see any further questions. If uh, that is the case, I will close this panel. I want to thank uh, Professor Leboeuf, Nicolas, Anne and Ralph for their participation. Oh, oh no, here we have another one. <laughs> it's, uh, sorry, I have to go back. Um, um, de force dont dispose les personnes qui nous considérons comme sont des troubles uh, here, uh, the question more, uh, what he's saying is that uh, uh, that we are talking always of the weakness. Normally, vulnerability by itself means a weakness. From uh, the, la the Latin roots is actually that this person is not in the same condition as the others. But here, the question is, why do we take into consideration 
the forces that uh, or the um, something that the migrant can bring in this determination. So I don't know, Professor Lebeuf, this is a more theoretical question. And Nicola, if you can give your perspective from. Yes, thank you. No, I think it's a, it's a, it's a crucial question. It's a very interesting one. Uh, well, if we look back actually at how the, the concept was developed, uh, it was developed as part of humanitarian and aid policies. That's where it originated. And the objective there uh, is indeed very much uh, to address vulnerability so that uh, resilient strategies can be enhanced. So behind this idea of uh, identifying uh, vulnerabilities and addressing them, there is the idea of focusing on what puts people in a situation where they cannot become self-reliant here in the asylum context, that will be where they cannot put forward their asylum application properly, where they won't get a first shot uh, at getting a fair decision process, uh, decision-making process on their asylum application. So I, I think to me, there is no uh, inherent uh, contradiction between uh, this attention to vulnerability and the recognition that people uh, also have strength. It's, uh, it's more about putting them in a position uh, where they can exercise the strength and uh, correcting, you know, giving them the, the, the small hints uh, they need uh, so that they can uh, fall back on their strength and become self-reliant. Uh, and I think a good example is, of that uh, is uh, the fact that you, you can have uh, a tutor that can be there or someone, a guardian or someone that helps an unaccompanied minor to uh, frame uh, his, um, his asylum story for uh, the asylum interview so that he knows uh, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, question he has to answer to, not in the sense that will direct what he says, but so that uh, he knows um, what the important elements are. Uh, so it's really much about that vulnerability. It's about uh, targeting and empowering people so that they be can become uh, self-reliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Leboeuf. Uh, Nicola, do you have something else to add to this? No, I fully agree with what uh, Pro Professor Leboeuf has just uh, said. Um, I just want to warn that uh, putting people into bureaucratic categories um, might um, stigmatize them and disempower them. Um, so we always need to be aware that um, we, we, we don't end up with um, this kind of practices that separate um, um, so-called vulnerable residents from the rest of the population and putting them in specialized categories as if they are abnormal. Uh, they are um, normal and we should enhance their capacities rather than um, uh, approaching them in a paternalistic way. I would like to add, Anne, if, she, if the Council of Europe has any particular position on this. Yeah, maybe I may add uh, something that the Council of Europe has developed a concept of intersectional um, vulnerability, which is, I think, quite interesting. It seems a weird term, but it takes into account uh, the fact that, for example, a young person as such is not vulnerable, but a young person who is a migrant and who might be also LGBTI person then we have to give a special focus to its situation. So it's not looking at, at one issue from one angle, but looking at several little issues, which as such might not be vulnerable, but together will really put the person in a vulnerable situation. And this is also what I think the court meant when it said that all asylum seekers could be vulnerable. They are not as such vulnerable when they arrive, but when you look at oh, what they encounter, uh, uh, went through, even if they're not victims of torture, even if they don't have a specific terrible situation, they might have here and there small trauma or small personal situations which put them in a specific situation. That doesn't mean that they need a specific um, reception uh, facility or uh, to be stigmatized in any way, but a special attention. The linguistic, the example of linguistic com uh, competences is a good one also. Uh, it is uh, stated in every text that they, uh, every migrant or every asylum seeker needs to receive information in a language they understand. Uh, but maybe this is not enough. Uh, what is their capacity of understanding what is in the document? Although they understand the language, do they understand the information that we want to, to pass on. And 
this is the difficult aspect of vulnerability assessment is it, it's not putting crosses or ticks in boxes, but looking at the wider picture and we're looking at this intersectionality between different um, vulnerabilities. I don't know if this brings anything to the discussion, but it's really interesting. We could go on forever on this and, and Council of Europe is only starting its work and listening, uh, I mean, starting or putting together, going a step further in its work and, and we will take on all the reflections of this uh, conference. Mm. Well, here we have another comment uh, from, uh, 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 it is not a little bit cynical that Europe claims uh, to want to focus his care on the most vulnerable person arriving on the territory and at the same time financing Frontex with a goal to leave a lot of needed people out of his, uh, of his borders in very complicated situations. Well, first of all, that is not, uh, is not the subject of this. We are dealing with vulnerable people in Europe. The idea of Frontex outside uh, the management of Frontex is uh, like any border uh, agency is the uh, job is to protect, but I don't know if uh, Professor Leboeuf wants to refer to this because this actually gets out of the scope of what we consider vulnerable at the moment. Yeah, I'd say that there is a, there is a balance and uh, it's inherent in the fact that we have a a migration policy and an asylum policy. You have uh, borders, and uh, not everyone uh, gets a uh, protection status in the end. So uh, that's uh, yeah, that, that's all linked, of course. Uh, the, I don't think there is an overall objective to, to use vulnerability in the most expensive way, so that uh, everyone can uh, can have access to a residence permit. I don't think that's uh, the reflection uh, which is being conducted now. That is more or less the, the idea, because here what we are trying to deal is the difference. Uh, what happened outside of the borders of Europe? I can actually say we we can actually say why the the countries in the in the Middle East, the rich countries in the Middle East, don't don't take refugees or what Israel is doing or other countries that could handle this is not only Europe that has this. We have uh, to a certain extent to protect our borders, but vulnerability is not taken into this context. Of course, there are vulnerable people out there. And this is the reason why uh, we have resettlement programs and relocation programs. You know, I believe this is out of the context. Well, I believe we arrived to the end of this session. Now, I want to thank the, the Professor Leboeuf, Nicolas, Anand for this. Like I already mentioned, uh, EMN uh, and the Council of Europe are working, are developing a collaboration in all these issues so we can work more together, develop more the discussion and try to find solutions in the future. I want to thank all of you for this very interesting panel. I want to thank also Ralph for having have the patience to address 23 member states. It's not always the same and easy task. And I want to thank Nicola. Felicil is always uh, ready to help us through our national uh, partners in Belgium, in Belgium, so I want to thank them too. So thank you very much.